Well, hello there. Welcome back to A People's Historian. I'm Jason Kishinev. We're reading Chapter 17 of A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Um, Civil Rights Movement, 1960s. In Birmingham in 1963, thousands of blacks went into the streets facing police clubs, tear gas, dogs, high-powered water hoses, and meanwhile, all over the Deep South, the young people of SNCC, mostly black, a few white, were moving into communities in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas. Joined by local black people, they were organizing to register people to vote, to protest against racism, to build up courage against violence. The Department of Justice recorded 1,412 demonstrations in three months of 1963. The imprisonment became commonplace. Beatings became frequent. Many local people were afraid. Others came forward. A 19-year-old black student from Illinois named Carver Neblett, working for SNCC in Terrell County, Georgia, reported, I talked with a blind man who is extremely interested in the civil rights movement. He has been keeping up with the movement from the beginning. Even though this man is blind, he wants to learn all the questions on the literacy test. Imagine, while many are afraid that white men will burn our houses, shoot into them, or put us off their property, a blind man, 70-year-old, wants to come to our meetings. As the summer of 1964 approached, SNCC and other civil rights groups working together in Mississippi and facing increasing violence decided to call upon young people from other parts of the country for help. They hoped that would bring attention to the situation in Mississippi. Again and again in Mississippi and elsewhere, the FBI had stood by. Lawyers for the Justice Department had stood by while civil rights workers were beaten and jailed, while federal laws were violated. On the eve of the Mississippi summer in early June 1964, the civil rights movement rented a theater near the White House, and a busload of black Mississippians traveled to Washington to testify publicly about the daily violence, the dangers facing the volunteers coming into Mississippi, Constitutional lawyers testified that the national government had the legal power to give protection against such violence. The transcript of this testimony was given to President Johnson and Attorney General Kennedy, accompanied by a request for a protective federal presence during the Mississippi summer. There was no response. Twelve days after the public hearing, three civil rights workers, Jim excuse me, James Cheney, a young black Mississippian, and two white volunteers, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, were arrested in Philadelphia, Mississippi, released from jail late at night, then seized, beaten with chains, and shot to death. Ultimately, an informer's testimony led to jail sentences for the sheriff and deputy sheriff and others. That came too late. The Mississippi murders had taken place after the repeated refusal of the national government under Kennedy or Johnson or any other president to defend blacks against violence. Dissatisfaction with the national government intensified. Later that summer, during the Democratic National Convention in Washington, Washington, Mississippi, Blacks asked to be seated as part of the state delegation to represent the 40% of the state's population who were black. They were turned down by the liberal Democratic leadership, including vice presidential candidate Hubert Humphrey. Congress began reacting to the black revolt, the turmoil, the world publicity. Civil rights laws were passed in 1957, 1960, in 1964. They promised much on voting equality, on employment equality, but were enforced poorly or ignored. In 1965, President Johnson sponsored and Congress passed an even stronger voting rights law, this time ensuring 
on the spot federal protection of the right to register and vote. The effect on Negro voting in the South was dramatic. In 1952, a million Southern blacks, 20% of those eligible, registered to vote. In 1964, the number was 2 million, 40%. By 1968, it was 3 million, 60%. The same percentage as white voters. The federal government was trying, without making fundamental changes, to control an explosive situation, to channel anger into the traditional cooling mechanism of the ballot box, the polite petition, the officially endorsed quiet gathering. When black civil rights leaders planned a huge march on Washington in the summer of 1963 to protest the failure of the nation to solve the race problem, it was quickly embraced by President Kennedy and other national leaders and turned into a friendly assemblage. Martin Luther King's speech there thrilled 200,000 black and white Americans. I have a dream. It was a magnificent oratory, but without the anger that so many blacks felt. When John Lewis, a young Alabama-born SNCC leader, much arrested, much beaten, tried to introduce a stronger note of outrage at the meeting. He was censored by the leaders of the march, who insisted he omit certain sentences critical of the national government and urging militant action. Eighteen days after the Washington gathering, almost as if in deliberate contempt for its moderation, a bomb exploded in the basement of a black church in Birmingham, and four girls attending a Sunday school class were killed. President Kennedy had praised the deep fervor and quiet dignity of the march, but the black militant Malcolm X was probably closer to the mood of the black community. Speaking in Detroit two months after the march on Washington and the Birmingham bombing, Malcolm X said in his powerful, icy, clear, rhythmic style, the Negroes were out there in the streets. They were talking about how they were going to march on Washington. That they were going to march on Washington. March on the Senate. March on the White House. March on the Congress. And tie it up. Bring it to a halt. Not let the government proceed. They even said they were going out to the airport and lay down on the runway and not let any planes, airplanes land. I'm telling you what they said. That was revolution. That was revolution. That was the black revolution. It was the grassroots out there in the street. It scared the white man to death, scared the white power structure in Washington, D.C. to death. I was there. When they found out that this black steamroller was going to come down on the Capitol, they called in these national Negro leaders that you respect and told them, call it off, Kennedy said. Look, you are all letting this thing go too far. And old Tom said, Boss, I can't stop it because I didn't start it. I'm telling you what they said. They said, I'm not even in it, much less at the head of it. They said, these Negroes are doing things on their own. They're running ahead of us. And that old shrewd fox, he said, If you all aren't in it, I'll put you in it. I'll put you at the head of it. I'll endorse it. I'll welcome it. I'll help it. I'll join it. This is what they did with the March on Washington. They joined it, became part of it, took it over. And as they took it over, it lost its militancy. It ceased to be angry. It ceased to be hot. It ceased to be uncompromising. Why, it even ceased to be a march. It became a picnic, a circus. Nothing but a circus with clowns and all. No, it was a sellout. It was a takeover. They controlled it so tight they told those Negroes what time to hit town, where to stop, what signs to carry, what song to sing, what speech they could make and what speech they couldn't make, and then told them to get out of town by sundown. I haven't heard that speech by him. The accuracy of Malcolm X's caustic description of the march on Washington is corroborated in the description from the other side, from the establishment, by White House advisor Arthur Schlesinger in his book, A Thousand Days. 
He tells how Kennedy met with the civil rights leaders and said the march would create an atmosphere of intimidation just when Congress was considering civil rights bills. A. Philip Randolph replied, The Negroes are already in the streets. It is very likely impossible to get them off, Schlesinger says. The conference with the president did persuade the civil rights leaders that they should not lay siege to Capitol Hill. Schlesinger describes the Washington march admiringly and then concludes, So, in 1963, Kennedy moved to incorporate the Negro Revolution into the Democratic Coalition. <coughs> but it did not work. The blacks could not be easily brought into the Democratic Coalition. The Democratic Coalition. When bombs kept exploding in churches, when new civil rights laws did not change the root condition of black people. In the spring of 1963, the rate of unemployment for whites was 4.8%. For non-whites, it was 12.1%. According to government estimates, one-fifth of the white population was below the poverty line and one-half of the black population was below that line. The civil rights bills emphasized voting, but voting was not a fundamental solution to racism or poverty. In Harlem, blacks who had voted for years still lived in rat-infested slums. In precisely those years, when civil rights legislation coming out of Congress reached its peak, 1964 and 1965, there were black outbreaks in every part of the country. In Florida, set off by the killing of a Negro woman and a bomb threat against a Negro high school. In Cleveland, set off by the killing of a white minister who sat in the path of a bulldozer to protest discrimination against blacks in construction work. In New York, set off by the fatal shooting of a 15-year-old Negro boy during a fight with an off-duty policeman. There were riots also in Rochester, Jersey City, Chicago, Philadelphia. In August 1965, just as Lyndon Johnson was signing into law the Strong Voting Rights Act, providing for federal registration of black voters to ensure their protection, the black ghetto in Watts, Los Angeles, erupted into the most violent urban outbreak since World War II. It was provoked by the forcible arrest of a young Negro driver, the clubbing of a bystander by police, the seizure of a young black woman falsely accused of spitting on the police. There were rioting in the streets, looting and firebombing of stores. Police and National Guardsmen were called in. They used their guns. Thirty-four people were killed, most of them black, hundreds injured, four thousand arrested. Robert Connaught, Cano, a West Coast journalist, wrote of the riot. In Los Angeles, the Negro was going on record that he would no longer turn the other cheek. That, frustrated and goaded, he would strike back, whether the response of violence was an appropriate one or no. In the summer of 1966, there were more outbreaks, with rocks throwing, looting, and firebombing by Chicago blacks and wild shootings by the National Guard. Three blacks were killed, one a 13-year-old boy, another a 14-year-old pregnant girl. In Cleveland, the National Guard was summoned to stop a commotion in the black community. Four Negroes were shot to death, two by troopers, two by white civilians. It seemed clear by now that the nonviolence of the Southern movement, perhaps tactically necessary in the Southern atmosphere and effective because it could be used to appeal to national opinion against the segregationist South, was not enough to deal with the entrenched problems of poverty in the black ghetto. In 1910, 90% of Negroes lived in the South. 90%. But by 1965, mechanical cotton pickers harvested 81% of Mississippi Delta cotton. Between 1940 and 1970, 4 million blacks left the country for the city. By 1965, 
80% of blacks lived in cities and 50% of the black people lived in the north. A lot of statistics. There was a new mood in SNCC and another and among many militant blacks. Their disillusionment was expressed by a young black writer, Julius Lester. <clears throat> now it is over. America has had chance after chance to show that it really meant that all men are endowed with certain inalienable rights. Now it is over. The days of singing freedom songs and the days of combating bullets and billy clubs with love. Love is fragile and gentle and seeks a like response. They used to sing I love everybody as they duck bricks and bottles. Now they sing too much love, too much love. Nothing kills a inward like too much love. In 1967, in the black ghettos of the country, came the greatest urban riots of American history. According to the report of the National Advisory Committee on Urban Disorders, they in involved Negroes acting against local symbols of white American society, symbols of authority and property in the black neighborhoods, rather than purely against white persons. The commission reported eight major uprisings, 33 serious but not major outbreaks, and 123 minor disorders. 83 died of gunfire, mostly in Newark and Detroit. The overwhelming majority of the persons killed or injured in all the disorders were Negro civilians. The typical rioter, according to the commission, was a young high school dropout, but nevertheless somewhat better educated than his non-rioting Negro neighbor and usually underemployed or employed in a menial job. He was proud of his race, extremely hostile to both whites and middle class Negroes, and although informed about politics, highly distrustful of the political system. The report blamed white racism for the disorders and identified the ingredients of the explosive mixture which has been accumulating in our cities since the end of World War II. Pervasive discrimination... What is this? This is the report. Pervasive discrimination and segregation in employment, education, and housing. Growing concentrations of impoverished Negroes in our major cities creating a growing crisis of deteriorating facilities and services and unmet human needs. A new mood has sprung up among Negroes, particularly the young, in which self-esteem and enhanced racial pride are replacing apathy and submission to the system. But the commission report itself was a standard device of the system when facing rebellion. Set up an investigating committee, issue a report, the words of the report, however strong, will have a soothing effect. That didn't completely work either. Black power was the new slogan, an expression of distrust of any progress given or conceded by whites, a rejection of paternalism. Few blacks, or whites, knew the statement of the white writer Aldous Huxley, liberties are not given, they are taken. But the idea was there in black power, also a pride in race, an insistence on black independence, and often on black separation to achieve this independence. Excuse me. Malcolm X was the most eloquent spokesman for this. After he was assassinated, as he spoke on a public platform in February 1965, in a plan whose origins are still obscure, he became the martyr of this movement. Hundreds of thousands read his autobiography. He was more influential in death than during his lifetime. Martin Luther King, though still respected, was being replaced now by new heroes. Huey Newton of the Black Panthers, for instance. The Panthers had guns. They said blacks should defend themselves. Malcolm X in late 1964 had spoken to black students from Mississippi visiting Harlem. 
You'll get freedom by letting your enemy know that you'll do anything to get your freedom. Then you'll get it. It's the only way you'll get it. When you get that kind of attitude, they'll label you as a crazy Negro, or they'll call you a crazy N-word. They don't say Negro. Or they'll call you an extremist, or a subversive, or seditious, or a red, or a radical. But when you say stay radical long enough and get enough people to be like you, you'll get your freedom. Congress responded to the riots of 1967 by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Presumably, it would make stronger the laws prohibiting violence against blacks. It increased the penalties against those depriving people of their civil rights. However, it said, the provisions of this section shall not apply to acts or omissions on the part of law enforcement officers, members of the National Guard, or members of the armed forces of the United States who are engaged in suppressing a riot or civil disturbance. Wow. Furthermore, it added a section agreed to by liberal members of Congress in order to get the whole bill passed that provided up to five years in prison for anyone traveling interstate or using interstate facilities including mail and telephone, to organize, promote, encourage, encourage, <laughs> participate in, or carry on a riot. It defined a riot as an action by three or more people involving threats of violence. The first person prosecuted under the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was a young black leader of SNCC, H. Rapp Brown, who had made a militant, angry speech in Maryland just before a racial disturbance there. Later, the act would be used against anti-war demonstrators in Chicago, the Chicago 8th. Martin Luther King himself became more and more concerned about problems untouched by civil rights laws, problems coming out of poverty. In the spring of 1968, he began speaking out against the advice of some Negro leaders who feared losing friends in Washington against the war in Vietnam. He connected war and poverty. It's inevitable that we've got to bring out the question of the tragic mix-up in priorities. We're spending all of this money for death and destruction and not nearly enough money for life and constructive development. When the guns of war became a national obsession, become a national obsession, social needs inevitably suffer. King now became a chief target of the FBI, which tapped his private phone conversations and sent him fake letters, threatened him, blackmailed him, and even suggested once in an anonymous letter that he commit suicide. FBI internal memos discussed finding a black leader to replace King. As the Senate report on the FBI said in 1976, the FBI tried to destroy Dr. Martin Luther King. King was turning his attention to troublesome questions. He still insisted on nonviolence. Riots were self-defeating, he thought, but they did express a deep feeling that could not be ignored. And so, nonviolence, he said, must be militant, massive nonviolence. He planned a, people, a poor people's encampment in Washington, this time not with the paternal approval of the president, and he went to Memphis, Tennessee to support a strike of garbage workers in that city. There, standing on a balcony outside his hotel room, he was shot to death by an unseen marksman. The poor people's encampment went on, and then it was broken up by police action, just as the World War I Veterans Bonus Army of 1932 was dispersed. The killing of King brought new urban outbreaks all over the country, in which 39 people were killed, 35 of them black. Evidence was piling up that even with all of the civil rights laws now on the books, the court would not protect blacks against violence and injustice. One. Is this a report? 
One, in the 1967 riots in Detroit, three black teenagers were killed in the Algiers Motel. Three Detroit policemen and a black private guard were tried for this multiple murder. The defense conceded. A UPI dispatch said that the four men had shot two of the blacks. A jury exonerated them. Two, in Jackson, Mississippi, in the spring of 1970, on the campus of Jackson State College, a Negro college, police laid down a 28-second barrage of gunfire using shotguns, rifles, and a submachine gun. 400 bullets or pieces of buckshot struck the girls' dormitory and two black students were killed. A local grand jury found the attack justified and U.S. District Court Judge Harold Cox, a Kennedy appointee, declared that students who engage in civil disorders must expect to be injured or killed. Three. In Boston in April 1970, a policeman shot and killed an unarmed black man, a patient in a ward in the Boston City Hospital, firing five shots after the black man snapped a towel at him. The chief judge of the Municipal Court of Boston exonerated the policeman. In Augusta, Georgia, in May 1970, six Negroes were shot to death during looting and disorder in the city. The New York Times reported, A confidential police report indicates that at least five of the victims were killed by the police. An eyewitness to one of the deaths said he had watched a Negro policeman and his white partner fire nine shots into the back of a man suspected of looting. They did not fire warning shots or ask him to stop running, said Charles A. Reed, a 38-year-old businessman. In April 1970, a federal jury in Boston found a policeman had used excessive force against two black soldiers from Fort Devens, and one of them required 12 stitches in his scalp. The judge awarded the servicemen $3 in damages. These were normal cases, endlessly repeated in the history of the country, coming randomly but persistently out of a racism deep in the institutions, the mind of the country. But there was something else, a planned pattern of violence against militant black, black organizers carried on by the police and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. On December 4, 1969, a little before five in the morning, a squad of Chicago police armed with a submachine gun and shotguns raided an apartment where Black Panthers lived. They fired at least 82 and perhaps 200 rounds into the apartment, killing 21-year-old Black Panther leader Fred Hampton as he lay in his bed and another Black Panther, Mark Clark. Years later, it was discovered in a court proceeding that the FBI had an informer among the Panthers and that they had given the police a floor, plan, a floor plan of the apartment, including a sketch of where Fred Hampton slept. Was the government turning to murder and terror because the concessions, the legislation, the speeches, the intonation of the civil rights hymn We Shall Overcome by President Lyndon Johnson were not working? It was discovered later that the government in all the years of the Civil Rights Movement, while making concessions through Congress, was acting through the FBI to harass and break up black militant groups. Between 1956 and 1971, the FBI concluded a massive counterintelligence program known as COINTELPRO that took 295 actions against black groups. Black militancy seemed stubbornly resistant to destruction. A secret FBI report to President Nixon in 1970 said a recent poll indicates that approximately 25% of the black population 
has a great respect for the Black Panther Party, including 43% of blacks under 21 years of age. Was there fear that blacks would turn their attention from the controllable field of voting to the more dangerous arena of wealth and poverty, of class conflict? In 1966, 70 poor black people in Greenville, Mississippi occupied an unused Air Force barracks until they were evicted by the military. A local woman, Mrs. Unita Blackwell, said, I feel that the federal government have proven that it don't care about poor people. Everything that we have asked for through these years has been handed down on paper. It's never been a reality. We the poor people of Mississippi is tired. We're tired of it, so we're going to build for ourselves because we don't have a government that represents us. And let's call it there. We'll pick up next time. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed tonight's reading. Please do remember to hit the like and subscribe button and that notification bell because YouTube is known to unsubscribe people. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Have a good one.